So one of the most difficult realities of the chaotic world that Zainab described is that at this moment in history, what I would call true leadership in the sense of serving the people is under attack and in danger of disappearing. As a result, trust is eroding in all sectors of society. I believe that the world is like a social tapestry. At every intersection of two threads, there is a need for bridging leadership because at any one place, it could actually fall apart or disintegrate. Clearly, we have work to do, all of us, together. Doing the reweaving wherever the particular threads in our particular part of the universe are fraying and need repair. Synergos is committed to building and supporting bridging leadership that promotes trust, collaboration, and social action. At Synergos, we want to become bridging leaders ourselves. We believe in it, we study it, we teach it, and we try to practice it. Since many of us met together last year, the Synergos community has engaged in a process to transform the experience of the past into a strong framework for the future. Guided by our new CEO, Henri Van Egan, who I invite you all to meet and welcome in with the same joy and enthusiasm that I feel having him on board. With the board, our GPC members, our senior fellows, and the staff, we've all worked together to examine what has and has not worked within Synergos for the past 33 years. Critical questions and models for change are being debated and discussed, and bridging leadership is emerging as the spine of the Synergos approach. It strengthens our humanity to build a future that is fair, inclusive, and regenerative. Bridging leadership is a blueprint for action grounded in trust. And inner work, mindfulness for social action, empowers each of us to become a bridging leadership, to address complex problems, and work in partnerships for action and change. Inner work, trust, and collaboration will create the foundation to overcome the broken systems we face today and make a pragmatic commitment to the power of the possible. So tonight, we are here to honor the Global Sustainability Network and Saru Jayaraman, co-founder of Restaurant Opportunities Centers United. And I'm gonna introduce Saru now. On 9-11, Hundreds of restaurant workers lost their jobs the day the tower fell. Saro initially reached out to displaced World Trade Center workers, many marginalized women and undocumented workers, to help them find new jobs. She listened to their stories about working conditions and income inequality. It became clear that systemic change in the conditions of the 13 million people who work in the food service industry was needed. The Yale Law School and Harvard Kennedy School of Government graduate co-founded Restaurant Opportunities Center United to fight for a fair wage and workplace justice. Today, ROC has 25,000 worker members, partners with over 750 responsible restaurant owners to promote the high road to profitability. It has trained more than 5,000 people to advance to livable wage jobs within the industry and published over 30 groundbreaking reports and mounted policy campaigns at the local, state, and federal level to win minimum wage increases for those who work for tips. Sara was listed in CNN's top 10 visionary women and was awarded the James Beard Foundation Leadership Award in 2015. She is the author of the bestseller, Behind the Kitchen Door, and Forked, a new standard for American dining. Please welcome Saro Jayaranam, 2019 recipient of the David Rockefeller Bridging Leadership Award.
Oh, thank you so much, Peggy. Um, you're such an inspiration to all of us. Um, and thank you, Zainab, wherever you are. <laughs> um, and all of you at Synergos, um, this is really an honor and the idea of a world built on trust and bridging is really kind of what we've been all about. And so it's, it's a very deep honor to me to, to be here with you. Um, I wanna share just a quick little history that most people don't know about to give you a sense of the fight that we've been in that ultimately we're trying to build bridges to overcome. Um, but, but Peggy mentioned that I, I represent 13 million restaurant workers in the United States. The restaurant industry right now is the second largest and absolute fastest growing private sector employer in the U.S. One in 11 American workers currently works in restaurants. One in two Americans has worked in the restaurant industry at some point in their lifetime. Uh, and yet, despite the industry's size and its growth, you know, we just made world history last year becoming the first nation on earth People from other places will laugh at us, but we just became the first nation on earth in which we spend more money on food eaten outside of the home than we do on food eaten inside of the home. We eat out a lot. Um, and that growth, though, unfortunately, has not translated into prosperity because despite the fact that we're the largest and fastest growing industry, we are the absolute bottom of the barrel, lowest paying. And in doing research as to how you've got one of the largest and fastest growing industries with the lowest paying jobs, you really have to go back in history because it turns out that tipping as a practice didn't originate in the US, it originated in feudal Europe. It was something that aristocrats and nobles gave to serfs and vassals, but always on top of a wage. When the idea came to the States, it was right around the time of emancipation of slavery, and the restaurant lobby demanded the right to hire newly freed slaves, not pay them anything at all, and have them live entirely on this newfangled idea called a tip. Now, at the time, there was a massive populist movement against tipping, saying that it was a vestige of feudalism. That movement spread to Europe got rid of tipping in much of Europe with the rallying cry, we're professionals, we don't need your tips. But here in the States, we went in the exact opposite direction because of emancipation, because of slavery. Uh, and because of slavery, we ended up with the zero dollar wage for a massive workforce that has gone all the way up to the incredible and whopping $2.13 an hour, which is the current federal minimum wage for tipped workers in the United States. And New York is one of 43 states in the United States that perpetuates this legacy of slavery with a sub-minimum wage for literally millions of workers, 70% of whom are women, 40% of whom are single moms, living on tips to feed their families, putting up with the worst sexual harassment you can possibly imagine because they're having to tolerate all kinds of inappropriate customer behavior to feed their families in tips. So we got an enormous lift with Me Too and Time's Up over the last year. 16 states introduced bills to get rid of this lower wage for tipped workers. Congress has bills moving, U.S. Congress has bills moving to eliminate the sub-minimum wage. There's been a huge, tremendous momentum to say income inequality in America is reaching unsustainable levels. Nobody should have to work on $2. Nobody should have to put up with sexual harassment to feed their families. It is, it is reaching a, a tipping point, no pun intended, but the fight is still incredibly difficult. The National Restaurant Association, which represents the chains, has been fighting us vitriolically, trying to shut us down. And in the midst of that, and by the way, also has created something called the Multinational Hospitality and Restaurant Association to try to spread the idea of a sub-minimum wage for tipped workers to other countries. So watch out if you're in other countries. But, but here in the States, that fight, which has been so vitriolic, we truly have tried to overcome through this idea through bridging. We've worked with 770 restaurant companies around the country who say, actually, we agree with you. You know, $2 doesn't work. Nobody should have to put up with this kind of sexual harassment. This is not sustainable. And it has been about trust. I sat down this morning with a very well-known restaurant company in Washington, D.C. that said, we didn't trust you previously because you're asking us to pay more, but we're beginning to see you're right. We read your book and we think you're right. And so, you know, it, t it does take the exact kind of work that you're talking about. It does take bridging, even when there's tr not trust, even when there's fear of change, which is fundamentally what this is about. Uh, but, but what the restaurants who work with us know, and then I will stop, because <laughs> I know I'm a little over time, but what the restaurants who work with us know is that when you've got a population of 13 million people who cannot survive, uh, are not able to put food on their own families' tables in, in one of the nation, one of the world's richest countries. 
they also are not going to give us the political will to do the things we do need to do, like save our planet uh, and take care of each other and make sure that we restore our democracy in the United States so that we can support other countries as well in a universal system of democracy. We can't do that as long as so much of our population, in fact, one third of our population is living in poverty even when they're working full time. It's impossible. And that growth from one in three working Americans working in full time to one in two working Americans working full time is entirely due to the growth of these huge industries that are allowed to get away with two dollars. But it can be changed. It can be overcome. We can change the way that we eat out, the way that we treat each other all through exactly this, by bridging, by working with employers, by thinking differently about our future and our country and our world. So I really appreciate uh, being here with you and thank you so much for this honor.